So friends, uh, welcome to this webinar uh, of uh, Young India Intensivist uh, Critical Care Sunday webinars number 32. And it is a proud moment this time for me, especially because this is from the Department of Medicine, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, AIMS being my alma mater. And uh, today's presentation will be done by Dr. Bhavesh Monlal. He's a senior resident, having just uh, cleared his uh, so we thank him for taking time out and making this lovely presentation. And he has been guided and the session will be moderated by Professor Naval Kishore Vikram, who was a former colleague at AIMS with me. And uh, moderating along with him will be Dr. Animesh Ray. So sir is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and he's also you know, qualified in critical care and pulmonology. So over to you, Bhavesh, for the proceedings. Thank you very much, sir. I'll be sharing my screen. Uh, is my screen uh, visible? Yes, please, sir. Yes. Uh, very good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Bhavesh. I am senior resident in the Department of Medicine, and I'll be presenting a case titled A Man with Metabolic Alkalosis and Respiratory Failure. I am thankful to my moderator, Professor Naval Kishore Vikram sir, and panelists Animesh Ray sir and Tapesh Bansal sir. Let's start with the case. Our patient is a 42-year-old male, resident of Delhi, married, businessman by occupation, non-alcoholic, non-smoker with no known comorbidities. He presented with five days of fever and four days of shortness of breath and dry cough to an outside hospital. With an initial uh, with an initial suspicion of pneumonia, the patient was evaluated and was found to have a positive RT-PCR test for SARS-CoV-2. His room air saturation at presentation to the outside hospital was 88%. Okay. A diagnosis of COVID-19 so, was made. So, uh, Dr. Bhavik, we just stop here. Now, this patient has tested positive for COVID fair and uh, well, but uh, this is a very common presentation to the critical care units and to the HDUs, fever, shortage of breath, dry cough, and uh, hypoxia. So, Dr. Ramesh, yes, sir, would you like to enumerate some of the differentials for this, apparently, a pneumonia? What else it should be considered in such situations? Right. So, um, when this happened, it was actually, you know, the peak of COVID season. So, COVID was obviously, obviously one of the common differential diagnoses. So, the other differential diagnosis which comes to our mind, since there's fever, we are thinking of about, uh, you know, an infective condition. So other causes of uh, pneumonia, other causes of uh, lower respiratory tract infection, like bacterial or other viral causes, uh, they should be considered. Uh, since the, you know, the patient had uh, no prior comorbidities, we are not thinking of any uh, cardiovascular uh, disease as such. So whenever we, th we think about shortness of breath and cough, we, we try to limit our differential diagnosis to uh, the respiratory system. So within the respiratory system, I think uh, infective cause in the form of pneumonia, whether it is bacterial or viral, there would be uh, the top differential diagnosis. So uh, other differential, non-infectious, anything you would like to consider, Dr. Nimesh or Dr. Uh, Navan? Or, you know, so something like probably, you know, uh, maybe vasculitis and uh, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, and, uh, you know, eosinophilic pneumonia, sometimes acute exacerbation of interstitial lung disease and uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And of course, uh, cardiac also pulmonary edema will not have fever, but if pulmonary edema occurs in the setting of viral myocarditis, there might be some degree of fever. So rightly said, Dr. Animesh, most of the uh, differential would come under pneumonia, either bacterial or viral. And viral is extremely important. It has been found in a recent study that 20% of all pneumonias getting admitted to the ICU are viral in origin. And the diagnostic ability for viral pneumonias has increased the you know, availability of RT-PCR for different tests. You know, you do this biofire on uh, viral samples, uh, respiratory samples, and you can pick up viral pneumonias. So 20% is the figure quoted in one a very popular study of viral pneumonias admitted to the ICU. And the differential is quite broad for uh, fever, infiltrates, and uh, hypoxia, cough, that is pulmonary symptoms, uh, short duration presenting to the ICU. So we must have a broader outlook uh, after pneumonias are ruled out. And of course, pneumonia is the first condition, but then the other condition should be kept at the back of our mind. 
and it is important not to lose time also and not just have a tunnel vision towards pneumonia. So I think we'll move on then. Please carry on. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the patient was diagnosed with severe COVID-19 infection and was and was admitted in COVID block in an outside hospital. The patient was started on remdesivir and steroids. In view of worsening type 1 respiratory failure with high work of breathing, the patient was intubated on day 6 of hospitalization. The patient developed severe ARDS while admitted in COVID ICU and had a CT severity score of 24 out of 25. The patient required prone ventilation and a single dose of tocilizumab was given in outside ICU. Eventually, the patient was tracheostomized and was transferred to our site on day 19 of hospitalization due to financial reasons and difficult weaning. The patient had no significant past medical history and at presentation to us, that is on day 19 of uh, hospitalization, the patient was conscious, oriented with a pulse rate of 100 per minute a blood pressure of 130 by 76 millimeters of mercury in right arm in supine position, respiratory rate of 24 per minute, a saturation of 93% on pressure support ventilation with a pressure support of 10 and a PEEP of 5 at 50% FiO2. The patient was afebrile. So I'd just like to say one thing here, uh, Dr. Bhavesh, about proning. Proning definitely, you know, uh, once the PF is less than 200, you prone the patients of ARDS, it helps a lot. But uh, awake proning, you know, we came in with a lot of uh, fanfare, but uh, subsequent studies have not shown an improved outcome uh, for prone uh, ventil awake proning. Now, awake proning does not alter the outcomes. It does improve the PF ratio initially, the oxygenation, but that is very physiological. Even if you were to prone yourself and you did not have any disease, you would improve your oxygenation by a small fraction because that is the way ventilation and perfusion is distributed in the prone and supine position. And uh, coming to the blood pressure here, any remarks on the blood pressure, Dr. Naval? So uh, the blood pressure here actually is a slightly wide pulse pressure. You know, 130 by 76 is uh, not really something we see normally. So a normal pulse pressure is around 40. Anything less than 30 is a narrow pulse pressure. And a wide pulse pressure is anything more than 60. So this is going towards a, some, somewhat of a wide pulse pressure. Whether it's because of COVID causing vasodilatation, uh, we really do not know. But uh, that is to be noted that the pulse pressure is slightly towards the wider side. So, any comments from anybody, please? Okay, carry on. Yes, yes. yeah, fine. Yes. So, on general physical examination, the patient had no pallor, ictrus, cyanosis, clubbing, lymphadenopathy, or edema. The JVP was not raised. On systemic examination, the respiratory system examination was significant for bilateral crepts, which were present in mammary, axillary, infraaxillary, interscapular, and infrascapular area. The other system examination was essentially unremarkable. So, what all do we have now? We have a 42 year old male with post COVID sequelae with type 1 respiratory failure. The initial routine investigations done in our hospital on day 19 of uh, uh, hospitalization showed a hemoglobin of 12.6 and a total leukocyte count of 12,200. The liver function test and the renal function tests were normal. Even the INR was normal. The chest X-ray. Just go back to the investigations. You have missed out one investigation in renal function. Which one? I think chloride is something we would like to have here because the patient has metabolic alkalosis and chloride would be important. You know, if you're talking about metabolic alkalosis. Then acidosis also has to be considered. And one has to look at it cap at some point in time, probably chloride should be there. And the other thing is, why is the patient's CLC 12,200? How would that possible? Yes. So uh, the patient was probably having a super added bacterial infection for which he was also on antibiotics when he came to us. So uh, the total counts were 12,200 and it was in a decreasing trend when he came to us. So was he on steroid at any time? Yeah, he was also on steroids. He was started on steroids for uh, his COVID pneumonia and he was on a tapering dose of steroids. I was going to mention that. Yes, yes. So it's more likely to be because of steroids than because, rather than an active infection? Yes, possible. Okay. Then coming to the creatinine, creatinine is very low. It is 0.5. And uh, so that is a low creatinine. How much was his body weight? You see, Bhavesh, one thing we must always do 
and we don't do is uh, talk about the body weight and the BMI. So that should always be there in the initial, you know, few slides that we talk about because body mass index has a bearing on everything. It has a bearing typically on the amount of fluids we are giving, on the amount of uh, the drug dosing we are doing. So some some idea of the body weight of the patient should be there in terms of BMI. So that gives you an idea whether it is normal BMI, lean or thin or overweight, which is a problem these days, you know. So a BMI should always be there, a rough estimate of the BMI. So now the, his body weight was okay, his BMI? Yes, he was around 65 kgs and his BMI was normal. Normal. So this is a low creatinine. If his beam mass was all right, this is a low creatinine of 0.5. So why do you think the creatinine is low here? Okay. So Animesh, any, Dr. Animesh sir, any, any comments, not normal? Yeah, so one yeah, thing is probably, okay. Yeah, go ahead, Tanvish, go ahead. No, uh, as uh, you were indicating, probably his muscle mass was on the lower side. So that is probably reflected by, uh, you know, the creatinine level. Uh, though his BMI was normal, but then, you know, uh, the, the weight, body weight is constituted uh, by both fat as well as uh, fat-free muscle mass. So I would suspect that, uh, you know, uh, that uh, either baseline he was uh, his muscle mass was on the lower side or due to the fact that he was having a prolonged illness that had led to some amount of muscle mass uh, in the in the uh, during the course of the present illness yes yes so absolutely that so, so that is what uh, i would go with that he had a prolonged illness he had a, had a body illness he was he was severe ARDS and he has been there for 15 20 days so there it is well known after one week of critical care illness the muscle breakdown starts and your creatinine starts going down. The other thing is probably he has got a lot of fluids also. He's probably in a positive fluid balance and he has received a normal saline, a lot of normal saline also because sodium is 144, 145 is the upper limit. So that is also another thing. If you give the commonest cause of hypernatremia in the critically ill is you end up giving a lot of normal saline. So probably both these factors contribute. The first one definitely that he has undergone catabolic destruction of the lean mass so the creatinine has gone down and second is probably there is a lot of uh, fluid extra fluid in his uh, body which has diluted the creatinine so this is another cause of a low creatinine you know these factors come into consideration when you try to estimate the gfr and that is why creatinine uh, you know in the icu has to be taken with a pinch of salt to calculate the gfr because of all these uh, variable factors so those are the points i just wanted to make and apart from that i don't think that there is anything uh, significant here so, Bhavesh, please carry on. Yes. Uh, the imaging done or uh, presented to us, the chest x ray showed bilateral, peripheral, and basal predominant reticular infiltrates. This was followed by a CT scan, which showed bilateral multifocal ground glass opacities, reticular opacities, and traction bronchiectasis with peripheral and basal predominance, suggestive of co post COVID fibrotic changes. There was also some pneumomediastinum that the patient was having. Any, any comments, anybody? Daughter, you want to say anything, Dr. Ramesh, sir, about the ECD? Uh, no, so, so the fact that he was in, you know, he was, uh, uh, he was on day 19 of his illness and the X-ray showed this feature. We can see some, uh, you know, some early honeycombing, which is, which is happening in the CT scan. Pavish, can you show the CT scan once? So peripherally, we can see that, uh, you know, there is some stacking of cysts, which suggests that early honeycombing has started. And uh, along with these uh, uh, opacities, which suggest both GGOs as well as you know fibrosis creeping in, so it suggests that this patient has started to develop the sequelae of COVID-19, and probably this patient is is in for a long haul. Right. So carry on, Doctor Balch. Yes, the blood gas analysis presentation to us showed a pH of seven point four three on pressure support ventilation with the pressure of 10 and a peep of 5 at 50% FiO2. The patient was having chronic respiratory alkalosis with metabolic compensation. His PF ratio was calculated to be 145. His input output was well balanced. So actually, this 1500 by 1300, would you call it uh, well balanced or would you call it he's going to negative balance? Uh, he seems to be slightly in a... Uh, to be well balanced. Actually, there is a element of insensible losses also, which is to the tune of 500. So this guy will probably be going into a negative balance here. 
you know, uh, standard uh, uh, fluid uh, loss, which is insensible is 500. Unless you have fever or some cause for excessive sweating or something. So if you add 500 to your output, this is 1500 by 1800, which is negative balance. Okay. Negative, negative balance, yes. And, and the other thing is uh, for everybody's uh, sake, the PF ratio, which is so commonly used, is not a fixed number. If you change the vent settings, especially the PEEP, your PF will change. That has to be borne in mind whenever we talk about PF ratio. Yes. So the patient was continued on meropenem and vancomycin, which was started in an outside hospital in suspicion of superadded ventilator associated pneumonia. Also, the patient was on a tapering dose of methyl alone which was further tapered from, uh, 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 from, the, from the time he came to our hospital. The patient was started on intended uh, from outside hospital and it was continued. The patient was kept on proton pump inhibitors and prophylactic anticoagulation. So I would be interested in knowing uh, why the patient is on vancomycin here. Because uh, any comments, Dr. Naval or Dr. Nimesar, why the patient is on vancomycin? Did we get anything in cultures? Or anywhere? No, no. So uh, at this point, Bhavish, this patient was coming from an outside hospital, and so right. So uh, at this point, when we received the patient, this patient was already on meropenem and vancomycin. I don't think that there is uh, any particular reason they have cited in their discharge summary or transfer okay. summary. But I would like to believe that uh, uh, probably he was on central lines, and uh, they must have suspected CR CRBSI, or they might have suspected a nosocomial infection and. MRSA uh, what was was probably a consideration. So they have added the bank to medicine. Well, so he, came uh, from, you know, he came from an outside hospital. So I would just like to highlight usage of vancomycin or ticoplanin. So if you guys have read, any of you uh, in the audience uh, uh, has read the latest surviving sepsis guidelines published six months ago, it makes a clear statement that the use of vancomycin or MRSA agent be avoided unless you have a specific reason to give it. Use of empirical vancomycin or ticoplanin or linzolate leads to adverse outcomes in the absence of a documented MRSA infection or unless you have a very strong suspicion. So this practice of giving vancomycin or linzolate or ticoplanin is widespread in our country. It may be all right for the West, where there is a very high incidence of gram-positive infections. In fact, the commonest bacterial infection in the West are all gram positive. The gram positive is slightly more than gram negative. However, consistently we have seen in our, in our country that we have mainly gram negative. Infections grow gram negative organisms rather than gram positive. So I would just like to emphasize for everybody, please do not use vancomycin, nexolate or decoplanin as the drop of a hat. You know, unless you have a strong suspicion for a gram positive organism like staph or strep or enterococci, Please avoid vancomycin. It is well documented in surviving sepsis guidelines that leads to worse outcomes. Uh, so uh, there are certain risk factors. Patient is on maintenance hemodialysis. Patient is, on, patient is immunocompromised. Patient is having skin and soft tissue infection and so on and so forth. And in influenza, yes, in influenza, you get a lot of staff. Agreed. So there you are justified as a bacterial infection. But no study has documented that there's an increased incidence of staph or gram positive infections as a second infection in COVID lungs. Am I right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, right, I, I agree, agree with, with that. you. Okay, carry on, please. Yes. So the patient was continued on meropenem vancomycin and the uh, <laughs> dose of steroids were further tapered. The patient's oxygen requirements should be tapered over next seven days in our hospital. His FIO2 requirements came down from 50% to 30%. He was hemodynamically stable. However, from during day 26 of hospitalization, the patient developed thick purulent secretions, ET secretions, and had persistent fever spikes. Also, his FIO2 requirements started increasing, and his PF ratio started decreasing. A suspicion of ventilator-associated pneumonia was kept, and blood cultures and ET aspirate cultures were set. The vitals on this day were a pulse rate of 118 per minute and a blood pressure of 100 by 62, which was lower than his uh, baseline blood pressures when he came to us. The other parameters were normal. The ET aspirate and blood cultures. Carry on, carry on. Yeah. The ET aspirate and blood cultures grew multi-drug resistant Klebsiella pneumoniae, which was sensitive to polymyxin alone. 
the patient was initiated on injection imipenem 500 mg iv qid with polymyxin 7.5 lakh units iv bd and the patient was also started on nebulization cholestin 4.5 million units bd so here i would like to know did you do a x ray so yes sir x ray was done yes, the yes. x ray was did done it, did it show increased opacities yes there were increased opacities on the left upper zone okay okay so that is fair enough then we can diagnose this as well because otherwise you know unless there is a uh, some kind of evidence of increased opacities uh, it becomes difficult to say whether you are dealing with wap or something else because klebsiella would grow anyway in a ed aspirate with the tube has been there for a number of days you will always get colonization so here you know whenever you diagnose wap or a nosocomial pneumonia one has to make a clinical correlate and be sure of what you are dealing with the other thing is uh, you have said that it was sensitive to polymyxin alone and now you have started on imipenem and nebulization of cholestin so was he sensitive to imipenem uh, the the culture report showed resistance to miropenem imipenem was not specifically checked for okay so uh, and uh, mm -hmm. the, and uh, any other drug it was phosphomycin etc pticycline phosphomycin mm -hmm. Uh, phosphomycin was not checked for. Tegcycline is usually uh, not having a very good lung penetration, and therefore we would not consider tegcycline in this case. Also, it was resistant to astuanab. If it was sensitive to astuanab, even that could have been used as an alternative. Since so, it was a here, here I would just like to clear the air a little about tegcycline. So, you see, yes, tegcycline is a drug uh, which, uh, as you rightly said, is not very good for pneumonia, but that is in usual doses of 50 milligram BD. But now it is well recognized that if you give 100 milligram per BD, then tegcycline as an adjunctive antibody does work. The reason why it does not work at 50 milligram BD is because the serum levels are not good enough to penetrate into the lungs. But subsequent studies have shown that if you give 100 milligram per BD, then tegcycline can be used as an adjunctive antibody for uh, pneumonia, so not the first line, but as an adjunct here. Like you have used imipenem, so probably with cholestin uh, you could have used it. So here we have used the uh, Cholestin for 4.5 and uh, injection minipenem. So that is, uh, well, antibiotics are always a uh, case for debate, but maybe uh, you could have used mm -hmm. cholestin also because nebulization cholestin along with injection cholestin is what is recommended if you are getting something like this uh, and you did not have imipenem sensitivity, but then the case for debate, antibiotics are always controversial. But the best way to use cholestin for pneumonia if you are getting sensitive is IV cholestin, 9 million units plus nebulization as you have used uh, 4.5 million BD. And when you use the nebulization, then you have to make sure that you do it properly. Nebulization has to be done properly. Otherwise, you're not able to get uh, the cholestin across into the parenchyma. So, three points I wanted to make. Anything so, the panel so, wants to add, yeah, please, your so, uh, so, in our, you know, in our, uh, in our institute, there is a policy that uh, regarding uh, uh, regarding use of polymyxin B for uh, KPC, it is not used uh, in isolation. It is used along with the second agent. Now, when we are adding second agent, the choices which we have, I mean, is uh, is either a carbapenem or, as you said, tegacycline or sometimes minocycline and other agents can be added. Now, for carbapenem, the usual practice is if the MIC is less than 8, then, uh, you know, according to IDSA guidelines, it is said that uh, even if the uh, overall resistance pattern shows resistance. Even then, carbapenem, uh, meropenem, or imipenem can be added to polymyxin B uh, or cholestin so as to make a regime, and that usually works. Uh, as far as uh, you know, cholestin use of cholestin is concerned, we generally prefer polymyxin because uh, uh, because of the you know the, the because of the adverse effect profile. I think we are more comfortable with polymyxin B, which has got uh, less. Uh, nephrotoxic effect and moreover polymyxin b can be used in standard doses with patients having renal dysfunction polymyxin b that is cholestin often you have to change the dose so polymyxin b has kind of become our you know the go-to drug as far as treatment of uh, you know crab or ppc is concerned yeah the point is well taken dr Ramesh, sir, that polymyxin definitely has a safer, safer profile easier to use in uh, conditions with renal failure but uh, the advantage of cholestin is one in terms of nebulization. Polymyxin is not for nebulization. Second, in urosepsis, cholestin remains the drug of choice. 
because of the fact that it goes through the renal tubules while polymyxin does not. And the third point against polymyxin, which certain people have found in clinical practice, is a higher degree of neuromuscular involvement leading to delayed meaning. There is some kind of a neuropathy or a neuromuscular involvement which leads to difficult. The advantages of polymyxin are also there compared to cholestin and one has to individualize. So I think your point is well taken. So let's move on. Uh, yeah, so continuing further, the patient's fever spike subsided after two days of change of antibiotics. The patient was continued on imipenem and polymyxin B. However, on day 31, the patient developed worsening alkalosis with certain electrolyte abnormalities. The vitals on day 31, that is the day 5 of change of antibiotics, was a pulse rate of 106 per minute and a blood pressure of 102 by 66. The blood pressure continued to be low compared to the baseline blood pressure we had seen. The patient had worsening alkalosis with pH now increasing to 7.5 and there was also an increase in bicarbonate from 22.8 to 26.8 indicating a component of metabolic alkalosis. The patient was also having hypomagnesemia during this time. So, so Dr. Bhavesh, the PC2 has dropped from 37 to 30 here. <laughs> so what is the reason for that? If you remember anything on the settings, wind settings or what happened? It is possible that uh, this was just because of the vent settings and increased okay. minute. Okay, tell you. So, uh, coming to metabolic alkalosis, a metabolic alkalosis can occur if there is an increased loss of hydrogen ions or there is a gain of bicarbonate ions. This can happen from a renal cause or a non renal cause. A more clinically relevant algorithm for uh, evaluating a case of metabolic alkalosis involves measuring urinary chloride levels and dividing metabolic alkalosis into chloride responsive metabolic alkalosis and chloride unresponsive metabolic alkalosis. Patients with urinary chloride of less than 20 millimoles per liter are said to have chloride responsive metabolic alkalosis and those with a urinary chloride of more than 20 millimoles per liter are said to have chloride unresponsive metabolic alkalosis. Generally, Patients with chloride responsive metabolic alkalosis have underlying volume depletion and chloride depletion. This can happen whenever there is a loss of chloride rich and acid rich fluid from the body, usually from a non renal source. This can include a GI loss of uh, acids such as vomiting and those who are on NG suction. Diarrhea generally causes metabolic acidosis, however, in patients with congenital chloride wasting diarrhea and those who are on chronic laxative use can have metabolic alkalosis, which is responsive to chloride. Patients with cystic fibrosis have a loss of chloride ions in their sweat and they have chloride responsive metabolic alkalosis. Also, patients who were on loop diuretics or thiazide diuretics in the past can have persistent metabolic alkalosis with low urinary chloride levels because of loss of action of loop and thiazide diuretics. Patients with urinary chloride of more than 20 millimoles per liter are said to have chloride unresponsive metabolic alkalosis and this generally happens in patients with mineralocorticoid excess. The mineralocorticoid excess can be either primary hyperaldosteronism or secondary hyperaldosteronism due to any cause. Also, patients with defect in the transporters in the tubules can have chloride unresponsive metabolic alkalosis such as those who are on loop diuretics or thiazide diuretics. Very rarely, certain salt wasting syndromes can also present with chloride and responsive metabolic alkalosis, usually in infancy. These disorders include Barter syndrome and Gittelman syndrome. So here, I just like to summarize this. You know, a clinical approach to metabolic alkalosis can be that you divide it into two types. One is responsive to volume, and the other is because of excessive steroids. Right? The one which is responsive to uh, volume will be having low chloride. Because when there is volume depletion, chloride is absorbed to a great extent. That is why you get a low chloride. And other conditions, like wherever there is steroid excess, either because of high renin, high aldosterone, or use of steroids, or whatever, wherever there is steroid excess, you will have a high urinary chloride. And of course, there are conditions like Barter and Gentleman, which he has shown, where there are tubular defects, congenital electric uh, tubular defects, where there is chloride wasting. Because this becomes uh, clinically relevant because you've got to understand, you've got to correct the metabolic alkalosis also. So either it is responsive to volume or it is not responsive to volume. And here your urine chloride less than 20 and urine chloride more than 20 comes into the picture. That's right, sir. Any, any comments, anybody, please feel free to make comments, Dr. Animesh, sir, and Dr. Naval, sir. Right, sir. So the, this is fine, sir. This is, this is... Carry on. Yeah. 
Yes. In our patient, the urine spot chloride was calculated, uh, measured to be 121 millimoles per liter. Therefore, our patient was having chloride unresponsive metabolic alkalosis. And as we discussed, this could be because of loop diuretic use or thiazide diuretic use, mineralocorticoid excess, or primary salt wasting disorders. Over the next three days, the patient had worsening metabolic alkalosis and the patient also developed hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. This can be seen in the uh, table here. The, the pulse rate had increased to 126 beats per minute. The blood pressure was still low compared to the baseline blood pressure. There was worsening metabolic alkalosis with a bicarbonate now increasing to 34.2 and a pH of 7.52. The patient had also developed hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia. So whenever we have a patient with hypokalemia, there are, uh, hypokalemia is usually due to one of the three causes. It could be either because of decreased intake or because of increased entry of potassium into the cells or because of increased loss of potassium from the body. The loss of potassium from the body can occur either from a renal cause or a non-renal cause such as GI or skin. So whenever we have a patient with hypokalemia, the first step involves ruling out low potassium diet as a cause of hypokalemia. This is usually easily evident based on the history and uh, this can be easily corrected. Also, increased entry of potassium into the cell can be uh, easily found out based on the history and uh, relevant, uh, his relevant history. Once we have ruled out low potassium diet and increased entry of potassium into the cell as the cause of hypokalemia, the next option that remains is increased loss of potassium. We can measure urinary potassium to see if there is renal loss of potassium and if there is no renal loss of potassium, that implies that the potassium loss is occurring from a non-renal source such as GI tract or skin. The further assessment includes acid-based status analysis and uh, hemodynamic analysis to look for other causes. So, looking at the approach to hypokalemia, whenever we have a patient Bhavesh, with hypokalemia... Bhavesh, one question for you. What do you think is the commonest cause of hypokalemia which is so common in the IC? Hypokalemia is widely prevalent in the IC all the time. We are correct. So, it's usually due to low diet, sir. It's usually yes. due to low diet. Absolutely, absolutely. There is a daily mm. requirement for potassium is 60 to 100 milliequivalents, and most of the patients are not getting enough potassium either on the drip or even the feeding is not adequate, so they do not get enough uh, oral potassium. Absolutely. Very good. Yeah. And one thing I would like to say, you know, for approaching any electrolyte disorder, that is be it potassium or magnesium or phosphate. Of course, sodium is different. Sodium follows water. You have to divide it into uvolumic, hypervolumic, and hypovolumic. For potassium, phosphate, and magnesium, you know, try to distribute the causes into five categories, like we were showing. One, decrease intake. Second, increase GI losses. Third, increase renal losses. Fourth, transcellular shifts. And five, drugs. And sixth, acidosis, alkalosis. And of course, seventh can be miscellaneous, but that normally fits into one of these categories. So if you have these six categories, increase intake, increase GI losses, increase renal losses, transcellular shifts, drugs, and acidosis alkalosis, you will find the cause of your electrolyte disorder. That is a broad uh, kind of a classification to look at any etiology of an electrolyte disorder. So uh, potassium, magnesium, and phosphate. Calcium, actually hypocalcemia in the ICU is a rarity. It's not common to have a, a, acute hypocalcemia developing in the ICU barring a few conditions. And sodium, like I said, goes with water. So there the classification is different. So that is a general approach to electrolyte disorders as far as etiology is concerned. So please carry on with your hypocalcemia approach. Uh, seeing about the approach to hypokalemia, whenever we have a patient with hypokalemia, first we will rule out the cause of low potassium diet as well as increased transcellular shifts. After ruling those th two things out, we are left with increased loss of potassium. And we saw the first step would be to evaluate the urinary potassium levels. If the urinary potassium is less than 15 milliequivalents per gram of creatinine, that means the patient is losing potassium from a non-renal source. This could be because of a GI potassium loss, <clears throat> or because of potassium loss in the sweat, which can happen in profuse sweating, or in patients who were uh, previously on diuretics or patients with vomiting or RT drainage. If the urinary potassium is more than 15 milliequivalents per gram of creatinine, this indicates that the patient is having renal loss of potassium. In our patient, the urine spot potassium was 43 milliequivalents per liter and urine spot creatinine was 11 milliequivalents per liter. So dividing urine spot potassium to creatinine, we get a uh, ratio of 3.9 milliequivalents per millimole of creatinine. 
However, in the algorithm we saw, we wanted the value in milliequivalents per gram of creatinine. So now let us see what would be the value in milliequivalents per gram of creatinine. One milliequivalent per millimole of uh, creatinine is equal to 8.5 milliequivalents per gram of creatinine. Therefore, 3.9 milliequivalents per millimole would be 20.7 milliequivalents per gram of creatinine. The derivation is actually pretty simple. We know that one mole of creatinine based on the atomic weights is equal to 113 gram of creatinine. Therefore, one millimole of creatinine will be 113 milligram of creatinine, which is equal to 0.113 gram of creatinine. Whenever we have to convert one milliequivalent per millimole to one milliequivalent per gram, we would just convert, we would change this one millimole into 0.113 gram, which will be equivalent to 8.85 milliequivalents per gram of creatinine. Hence, uh, our patient was having a urinary potassium creatinine ratio of 20.7 milliequivalents per gram of creatinine which was obviously more than 15. And therefore we concluded that our patient was having renal loss of potassium. The renal loss of potassium can either be because of the uh, osmotic diuresis and the accompanying increased urine output and consequently an increased potassium loss, or it could be because of an active process wherever where there is a gradient established, where, where there is a gradient and there is increased potassium in the tubules rather than on the other side of the tubules. So this can be found out by measuring a uh, value called as transtubular potassium gradient. Whenever the patient is having a transtubular potassium gradient of less than 2, it suggests osmotic diuresis as a cause of renal loss of potassium. In our patient, the, the transtubular potassium gradient is given by the formula of urinary potassium into serum osmolarity divided by urine osmolarity into serum potassium. Substituting the values for these, we get a uh, potassium urinary potassium of 43 into serum osmolarity of 290 divided by serum potassium of 3 into serum osmo urinary osmolarity of 391, we get a value of 10.63. This value is more than 4. Therefore, we are thinking that the patient is not having osmotic diuresis as a cause of renal loss of potassium. The next step would be then to evaluate the blood pressure and volume status. If the patient is having hypervolemia or hypertension, that indicates that the patient is having mineralocorticoid excess. The mineralocorticoid excess can be because of increased mineralocorticoids such as primary hyperaldosteronism or secondary hyperaldosteronism or because of increased corticosteroids which also have a mineralocorticoid action. The general causes of uh, hypokalemia with uh, hypertension is Cushing syndrome, Liddell syndrome, syndrome of inappropriate mineralocorticoid excess, patients with primary hyperaldosteronism or patients with secondary hyperaldosteronism due to renin secreting tumor or renal artery stenosis. From the vitals of our patient, we knew that our patient was having hypo, uh, hypotension. Therefore, we would go along this pathway. The next step would be to uh, assess the acid-base status, whether the patient is having metabolic acidosis or metabolic alkalosis. If the patient is having metabolic acidosis, that indicates renal tubular acidosis, DKA, or uh, because of tubulopathies due to amphotericin or acetazolamide as a cause of hypokalemia. If the patient has metabolic alkalosis, the metabolic alkalosis, as we saw, is further subdivided into chloride responsive and chloride unresponsive metabolic alkalosis. And in patients with vomiting and chloride diarrhea, we would have chloride responsive metabolic alkalosis with hypokalemia and dehydration. In our patient, we had uh, seen that our patient was having chloride unresponsive metabolic alkalosis. Whenever we have a patient with chloride unresponsive metabolic alkalosis, the next step is to see for hypercalciuria. The hypercalciuria is seen by calculating the urinary calcium creatinine ratio. A urinary calcium creatinine ratio of more than 0.2 suggests that there is hypercalciuria, while a urinary calcium creatinine ratio of less than 0.5 indicates that there is no hypercalciuria. In patients with uh, no hypercalciuria, the cause would be thiazide use or Gittleman syndrome. And in patients with uh, hypercalciuria, the cause could be loop diuretic use or Barter syndrome. In our patient, the urinary spot calcium was 7.9 milliequivalents. Uh, one second, Bhavish, we just, can you go back to the previous slide? Uh, yes, sir. TTKG, can you show TTKG? Yeah. Okay, okay, so right, if you have to go back. So as far as TTKG is concerned, it is a debatable uh, uh, formula now. Actually, what has happened is that uh, the uh, uh, investigators who had done research on potassium had to come up with certain uh, theories, which uh, made them uh, formulate this transtubular potassium gradient. But uh, the, subsequently, what they found was that the assumption that they made in making this formula 
was itself wrong. So the people who actually formulated TTKG themselves found that one of the assumptions that they made and they discovered this, you know, they did the experiment, etc., was wrong. So TTKG has become debatable. And the finding was published, I think, in Kidney International five, six years ago. It continues to be published in uh, reputed books, even Harrison, I think, has TTKG and uh, certain other books. But uh, the use of TTKG is very cumbersome one, and second, it is debatable. So, you know, that is where TTKG stands. Secondly, uh, we have two tests, you know, uh, urine tests to evaluate potassium in the setting of hypokalemia. That is one you can do the absolute value of potassium or you can do a potassium uh, norm, uh, normalized to creatinine. So which is better? So here, when it is normalized to creatinine, it is better than the absolute value. That is because, you know, if there is uh, oliguria or polyuria, when you bring in creatinine and normalize it to creatinine, that particular factor of poly, uh, polyuria or uh, oliguria is negated. You understand what I mean? If the losses are 16 milliequivalents in 24 hours and the urine output is 500 ml, then the actual concentration of potassium will go up. Similarly to the polyurea, 60 milliequivalents will go in four, four liters. So again, the concentration will go uh, a little haywire. But if you normalize it to creatinine, then you will get an absolutely correct value of potassium expression. So that is actually uh, more accurate than the one which we have shown very nicely. So that is just a few points I wanted to make about potassium uh, estimated estimation uh, for evaluation of hypokalemia. So any comments from Dr. Naval sir or Dr. Ranimesh sir, or should we carry on? Right. No, so yeah, I think the point that you made, yeah, yes. yeah the point uh, that the patient has made regarding uh, normalizing or correcting it for creatinine is very relevant because we will often come across this uh, situation in our uh, critically ill patients. Yeah, and you may go ahead. Yes, sir. No, so uh, what I'm seeing is uh, regarding hypokalemia, hypokalemia is one of the commonest electrolyte disorders seen in the ICU. So normally what happens is when we see hypokalemia, it's a pen habit that we, uh, we, we write the supplementation prescription for hypokalemia, potassium, so and so either in oral form or intravenous form, depending on the severity. Uh, that is true to uh, an extent because uh, that is okay to an extent because, you know, since it's a common problem, probably we cannot employ this algorithm in all, all cases of hypokalemia. But in those cases of hypokalemia where it is resistant to treatment or where it is associated with some other disorders like, say, metabolic disorders, metabolic alkalosis, metabolic acidosis, or you're finding that the patient has hypotension. So I think those are the premises where we should try to delve deeper into this algorithm, right? So those are the cases where we should try to find out, uh, send the urine potassium amount and, you know, find the normalized level. And then we should be uh, working the patient up according to this algorithm in order to reach a particular diagnosis. That's the point which I would want, want to. Thank you for your comments, Dr. Naval and Dr. Arimesh. Please carry on. So in our patient, the urinary spot calcium was 7.9 milliequivalents per liter and urinary spot creatinine was 11 milliequivalents per liter. And dividing the calcium to creatinine ratio, we get a urine spot calcium to creatinine ratio of 0.71, <clears throat> which was more than 0.2. Therefore, we were uh, thinking that our patient was probably on loop diuretics or was having a primary salt wasting disorder like Barter's syndrome. Our patient also had hypomagnesemia as we saw in the reports. And uh, hypomagnesemia generally in ICU is either because of increased uh, loss of magnesium from the GI tract or because of an increased loss from renal tract. Whenever a patient is on loop diuretic or thiazide diuretics, they can have hypomagnesemia. However, hypomagnesemia can also be seen because of increased renal loss in primary hyperaldosteronism. Patients who, are, uh, on, uh, who have acute alcohol intake, patients with uncontrolled diabetes, hypercalcemia, recovering AKI, and certain uh, rare genetic disorders like Bartos and Jitterman syndrome. From all these things, it was becoming more and more clear that our patient was probably on loop diuretics and we probably did not recognize that our patient was on loop diuretics because Bartos syndrome is a genetic disorder which usually presents in infancy and that was not even in our differentials, uh, strong differentials. So, uh, but, here the magnesium has gone very low. Have we, did we see any clinical features of hypomagnesemia? Or have you ever seen any clinical features of hypomagnesemia, Dr. Babesh? Sir, uh, yes, sir. Uh, hypomagnesemia uh, usually resembles this, uh, causes symptoms of increased neuromuscular excitability, and they can also de develop cardiac toxicity with cardiac arrhythmias. Uh, 
they can have features similar to hypocalcemia and uh, also have uh, ecg abnormalities and uh, arrhythmias okay very good is there any one diagnostic clinical sign of hypomagnesemia severe hypomagnesemia diagnosis clinical yes, sign sir uh, long qt with uh, torsion no, point is not ecg clinical sign or clinical severe hypomagnesemia no sir i i don't know. okay it is vertical nystagmus so vertical okay. nystagmus in clinical medicine has only three differentiation uh, one is vernix encephalopathy second is vestibular or cerebral lesions structural lesions and third is hypomagnesemia so it is a very useful yes. clinical sign because we don't always see magnesemia I, i mean we don't always check magnesium levels in the icu magnesium levels do drop sometimes and they can lead to seizure symptoms also if you see you do not you do not have a magnesium level in front of you but the patient is exhibiting signs of hypomagnesemia is not doing well and you look at vertical nystagmus you know what you are dealing with if you exclude the other two conditions it is very useful though very rare even i have not seen it it is documented in literature now talking about clinical features of hypomagnesemia for a while one like you have said uh, some of the things it causes cardiovascular toxicity so why does it cause cardiovascular toxicity and a predisposition to arrhythmias so that is because uh, it is a cofactor for sodium potassium atps pump so that sodium potassium atps pump is very important to maintain the arrhythmic membrane function in the cardiac cells so when magnesium gets altered the rmp gets altered so there is a increased tendency towards arrhythmias that is the cardiac toxicity <clears throat> now it has a tendency to cause cns symptoms like seizures and dysarthria and uh, you know other kinds of uh, neurological involvement including altered sensorium so why does it cause seizures and other positive phenomena so one of the reasons is or the reason is that it inhibits glutamate at the uh, synapses in the brain and glutamate is a excitatory uh, molecule which leads to seizures so in the absence of uh, magnesium or low levels of magnesium glutamate is not inhibited and that leads to increased excitability in the brain and you get seizures and some of the other symptoms now third coming to the neuromuscular symptoms why do you get neuromuscular symptoms which mimic hypocalcemia that is because of an increased irritability in the nerves and the muscles and that is related to increased neurotransmitter so these are the core features of clinical hypomagnesemia in terms of symptomatology and why they occur uh, though definitely these are not common hypomagnesemia symptoms do not occur so commonly and they occur generally when serum magnesium is less than 1 mg per deciliter <laughs> so just a few things about magnesium any comments from anybody uh, so are most welcome that's fine it's fine please can carry on please welcome guys okay so what all do we have now we have our our patient is having chloride unresponsive metabolic acidosis hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia and the common etiology in all these conditions seems to be the loop diuretic use however we did not have our patient on loop diuretics there was no indication for loop diuretics in our patient and we were not giving any loop diuretic we cross checked our nursing chart if by mistake the patient is still receiving loop diuretic or if the patient is on loop diuretics the patient was not on loop diuretics we uh, checked the urine output and we saw that the patient was having diuresis the urine output was progressively increasing uh, which was initially not uh, very easily recognized because we are always thinking about the input output balance rather than the absolute value of urine output therefore uh, as we see here the patient was having progressively increasing urine output indicating that the patient was having diuresis the all pointers were towards a diagnosis of loop diuretic use whenever we have a patient with polyuria the first step in evaluation of polyuria is to measure the urinary osmolarity a urinary osmolarity of more than 300 milliosmoles per kg indicates that the patient has solute diuresis and if the urine osmolarity is less than 250 milliosmoles per kg the patient is uh, usually having water diuresis the water diuresis can occur in patients with primary polydipsia who are taking a lot of water in the diet or in patients with diabetes insipidus where there is uh decreased action of adh or decreased production of adh or reduced action of adh so the patients have dilute urine and polyuria solute diuresis generally occurs because of uh, glucosuria in patients who are on mannitol the patients who are on radio contrast dye patients with severe uremia and in resolving phase of atm and patients on diuretics 
Our patient's urinary osmolarity was 391 milliosmoles per kg, indicating that our patient was having solute diuresis, again pointing towards probably diuretic use because our patient did not have glucosuria, was not on mannitol, not on, uh, did not receive radio contrast dye, did not uh, have uremia or uh, did not have resolving phase of ATM. So all things were pointing towards diuretics. However, our patient was not on diuretics. So, so Bhavesh, the, Dr. Bhavesh, I would like to ask you, what is this urine osmolarity? Where does it come from? Would you like to talk about it? And what is the normal urine osmolarity? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, the urine osmolarity, either uh, it could be a calculated one or the measured one. The usually measured urine osmolarity is uh, less than 300 milliosmoles per kg. Sir. So, you see, Bhavesh, uh, the urine osmolarity actually comes from the total number of osmoles which are generated in the human body per day. And that you normally normal So, how many uh, osmoles are generated per day? So, around 600 milliosmoles are generated in normal metabolism. Right. And uh, you then take in water and water is excreted. So average man normally produces 600 milliosmoles and takes in two liters of water. So you excrete two liters of urine and 600 milliosmoles. That gives you a urine osmolarity of approximately 300. Uh, right. But if you take in a lot of water, then it becomes less. And if you take in less water, it will become more. Or if you take in a lot of uh, diet, you know, or, and metabolize extensively, then the osmoles will increase. So that is the way to understand urine osmolarity. And unlike uh, uh, your serum osmolarity, which is dependent on glucose, urea, and uh, sodium, sodium, your urine osmolarity is not like that. It is a measure of all the active particles in the urine because there is no glucose in the normal urine, right? So glucose is out. There's a lot more urea. And the other electrolytes come into the picture. So that is how uh, we try to understand urine osmolarity. And it is uh, to be understood that the kidney can have a urine osmolarity from 50 to 1200. That is its capacity. The, the most dilute urine can have 50 uh, milliosmoles per liter. And the strongest uh, or the most concentrated urine can be 1200 milliosmoles per liter. And that is wherein your definition of oliguria comes in. Oliguria is 500 ml per 24 hours. And like I told you, 600 milliosmoles are generated every day in a normal diet. So the, uh, the highest concentration can be 1200 milliosmoles. So if 600 milliosmoles are excreted in 500, you're able to excrete your daily solute load. So, but if the urine production goes below 500, you will not be able to excrete the daily or smaller load. That is why the 500 value is taken as a cutoff for oliguria. So just uh, to explain uh, osmolarity and all these uh, related terms. Please, Karim. Yes, thank you. Sir. Yeah. So our patient was having metabolic alkalosis, hypokalemia, hypercalciuria, hypomagnesemia, and polyuria. All, th all things pointing towards loop diuretic use. However, we had conclusively excluded possibility of loop diuretic as a cause of uh, all these findings because our patient was not on loop diuretics. The only other possibility that remained was Barter syndrome. Barter syndrome is an autosomal recessive disorder, which is very rare. The estimated prevalence is one in one million population. This is a defective sodium potassium two chloride transporter in thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. And this disorder often presents in early in infanthood, usually presents in uh, infancy or in prenatal period. This mimics chronic loop diuretic ingestion. So basically, there is a dysfunction of sodium potassium 2 chloride channel in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. As a result, the sodium potassium and chloride are not absorbed in loop of Henle. This, uh, thus, there is an increased distal delivery of sodium potassium and chloride and increased loss of sodium potassium and chloride in the urine. This causes uh, increased loss of water along with these osmoles. And as a result, there is volume depletion. This activates renin angiotensin aldosterone uh, pathway and there is secondary hyperaldosteronism. Whenever there is hyperaldosteronism, the sodium in the distal tubules will be exchanged with potassium and hydrogen ions and sodium will be reabsorbed in exchange for potassium and hydrogen. This would cause hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis in patients with Barter syndrome. Also, the uh, sodium potassium 2 chloride channel in loop of Henle is essential for generating an electrochemical gradient, which is responsible for absorption of your uh, calcium and magnesium. So whenever there is a defect in the sodium potassium 2 chloride channel in the loop of Henle, there is an impaired electrochemical gradient, 
which will cause increased urinary loss of calcium and magnesium because these are not being absorbed in the renal tubules. Thus, the patient would end up with metabolic alkalosis, hypokalemia, hypercalciuria and hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia associated with polyuria. However, Barter syndrome, as we saw, is a, a, a genetic disorder which usually presents in infancy. Barter syndrome is classified into five types, with type 3 and type 5 being uh, milder variants of Barter syndrome and which can present in adulthood. However, even these syndromes would present only in uh, patients, uh, this, these syndromes would have continuous uh, electrolyte abnormalities and it, no, it would not be fluctuating as in our case. Our patient did not have any electrolyte abnormalities and did not have any acid-based disturbance prior to the uh, initiation of certain uh, medications. So we were probably not uh, thinking of Barter syndrome in our patient. So our patient was having features suggestive of Barter syndrome, but it was not actually Barter syndrome because he was completely normal before the uh, symptoms, before all the electrolyte abnormalities developed. So this, could ha this can happen in uh, patients with certain Barter-like syndrome. So when we reviewed the literature for various Barter-like syndromes, we came across a syndrome called East syndrome. East syndrome is a mutation in uh, in East syndrome. There is a mutation in KCNJ10 gene. As such, the sodium potassium chloride transporter itself is normal, but there is a defect in this gene which will present with epilepsy, severe ataxia, sensory neural hearing loss, and tubulopathy in infancy. It would uh, lead to similar electrolyte abnormalities with renal salt wasting, hypokalemia, metabolic alkalosis, but a normal blood pressure. Another possibility that uh, our patient could have was acquired Barter syndrome. As these metabolic abnormalities were not present initially and developed in hospital, our patient was probably having acquired Barter syndrome. Drugs are the most commonly implicated cause for acquired Barter syndrome. So we reviewed the literature for various causes of acquired barter-like phenotype and we came across uh, around 14 case, uh, case studies, uh, 14 case reports which had mentioned a barter-like phenotype in patients after certain conditions. So most common uh, agent was drugs which was responsible for acquired barter-like phenotype and polypeptide antibiotics and aminoglycoside antibiotics were the most commonly implicated drugs. There were four uh, case reports of patients with polystine-induced barter-like phenotype and there were four case reports of uh, streptomycin aminoglycoside induced barter like phenotype. Barter like phenotype has also been reported in patients with sarcoidosis, patients with Jogren syndrome, and patients with Hashimoto's thyroiditis. In our patient, the findings of uh, polyuria, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and metabolic alkalosis had temporal correlation with initiation of polymyxin B and nebulized cholestin. We saw that cholestin was a commonly implicated agent for causing barter-like phenotype. Therefore, we went along. Uh, we went. Actually, actually, Bhavesh, I would like to point out one thing: when you nebulize with cholestin, the serum levels are very, very low of uh, nebulized cholestin, and they are not really known to cause nephrotoxicity. So here, I think I will go with polymyxin B causing the nephrotoxicity, though it is very rare. But uh, I would not go with cholesterol because a uh, nebulized cholesterol, it has been very well documented, but nebulized, the serum levels are very low. Uh, and the other thing is here, there are other things. If you go back to the slide where you showed the increased volumes, can you go back to the slide right in the middle? Yeah, increased volumes. So it has started from the beginning, like I pointed out. The output was 1500 uh, there itself. So here, and then he has received vancomycin. So here, I think it is multifactorial. They could be covert induced uh, renal disease. Mild sudden renal disease causing tubular dysfunction because you see right there it is 1300 by 1500 like I pointed out. Then you have used vancomycin. Vancomycin is very well known to use tubular injury, known to cause tubular injury. And then you have used your polymyxin and cholestin and cholestin uh, nebulized will not cause it. Please take it from me. The serum levels are very low. And your polymyxin B is very rare nephrotoxic but can cause. So I think there is a, and definitely there is a temporal relationship. So polymyxin is the main culprit, but here you cannot ignore the role of vancomycin as well as covert induced uh, renal disease, tubular dysfunction. Because at day, at day 19 itself, when you're, you're having a 1500 by 1300 a negative balance. And you know, so these things have to be taken into consideration here. And yes, sir. Something uh, the panelists want to add because they were seeing the case. I, I mean, I, I have not seen the case. Uh, as such. Right. 
So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, yes, sir, please, sir, after you, sir. Carry on, carry on, please, after you. So, uh, so, uh, so, I mean, Dr. Uh, Bansal's point is well taken that, you know, vancomycin is also known to cause uh, nephrotoxicity. But here, what we felt was that even when the patient was receiving vancomycin, the urine output was a little on the higher side, but the telltale electrolyte disorders like hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, they were not there. So, um, after we discontinued vancomycin and this polymyxin B was started, then, you know, this urine output went up further and these telltale features of electrolyte disturbances, hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia, they became manifested. So, to our mind, what, what was, uh, I mean, uh, it seemed that polymyxin B, as you rightly said, uh, Dr. Bunsen, is a real main culprit. However, uh, there might be some role of uh, adjunct antibiotics like vancomycin and uh, the patient's underlying condition that is COVID-19. You would agree with that, Naval sir? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, that is what yeah, I yeah. have Yes, I do agree because uh, nebulized collision doesn't reach that, that levels to cause a renal uh, dysfunction. I agree with Dr. Tapesh there. Yes. So, so Bhavesh, why is this not acquired gentleman syndrome? Yes, sir. Uh, so there was hypercalciuria. Determined syndrome usually has hypocalciuria and hypercalcemia. Our patient was having hypercalciuria. Okay. Any other difference? Sir, uh, that, that yeah, is the main. Sir. Yeah. It's very rare. It's only, you know, most of the, all patients with uh, gentlemen have uh, hypomagnesemia, while only 20% of bar drugs have hypomagnesemia. So that should also be more in mind. And of course, you have used the term acquired barters, but barters does not uh, normally occur in adulthood. It is a disease of children and infancy. So those things have to be mind. Gentleman is actually called the adult variant of Bartas with the minor differences that, that we have just said. So th th those things should be more in mind. And, uh, you know, gentlemen, we don't get Bartas. Uh, this is a quiet Bartas drug and it's very rare. But uh, what you do get is, uh, gentlemen, if it comes with uh, hypokalemic alkalosis, normal blood pressure, and you'll have low magnesium and the patient will be chronically, you know, fatigued and some muscle pain, muscle cramps, etc. So, gentlemen, definitely once in a while you will get and you have to make the diagnosis. So please carry on. Yes, sir. Uh, so, as you rightly pointed out, polymyxin and poly, uh, nebul uh, I was just mentioning that there was a temporal correlation with initiation of polymyxin B and nebulized cholestin, and uh, we had considered these possibilities. Also, uh, vancomycin had already been stopped uh, during this time, during this time when the uh, metabolic abnormalities started happening. So, uh, when we reviewed uh, the literature about uh, cholestin and polymyxin B, we did not find any correlation, uh, any case report on polymyxin B associated barter like syndrome because generally, as you said, uh, nephrotoxicity is a rare manifestation of polymyxin B. That is why polymyxin B is generally preferred in uh, uh, clinical settings where uh, there is renal toxicity. So, we found around four case reports of cholestin associated barter like syndrome. And uh, usually the day of onset of Bartlett syndrome after starting cholestin was uh, variable between 3 to 14 days. And the day of resolution of Bartlett syndrome after stopping cholestin was uh, usually within uh, one week. So between 2 to 7 days. In our patient, the patient developed Bartlett syndrome after starting polymyxin B nebulization cholestin on day 4. So, uh, coming to uh, polymyxins, polymyxins are a group of polypeptide antibacterials that include polymyxin A to E. The polymyxins that are uh, clinically used are the polymyxin B and the polymyxin E. Polymyxin E is nothing but cholestin. The cholestin and polymyxin B are very similar in their uh, chemical structure, except that uh, polymyxin B has uh, phenylalanine in place of uh, leucine, which is present in cholestin. As we can see here, in polymyxin B, there is a uh, amino acid phenylalanine here, which is uh, replaced by leucine in cholestin. Otherwise, the structure is more or less similar. So, uh, we had uh, not seen any case of polymyxin B associated bartle like syndrome. And uh, as we knew that uh, the nephrotoxicity by polymyxin B is pretty rare, we first went ahead thinking along the lines of nebulization cholestin. And uh, nebulization cholestin, the one, uh, when we reviewed the literature, we found that the systemic cholestin levels attained after nebulization cholestin are very low, often uh, below the quantification threshold in patients on nebulized cholestin. In a study by Sophie et al., uh, they had noted that after repeated nebulization, uh, repeated nebulizations by cholestin, the cholestin concentration can uh, reach up to a level of 0.21 milligram per deciliter, which is much below the therapeutic uh, systemic level attained during systemic cholestin use, which is between 15 to 20 milligram per deciliter. 
Therefore, it was unlikely that the patient was having nebulization cholestine associated bartle like syndrome. So the other possibility was polymyxin B associated bartle like syndrome. So in a patient with normal renal function, approximately 30% of cholestimethate sodium is converted to cholestine and 64% of cholestimethate sodium is exchanged, excreted unchanged in the urine. However, the proportion of polymyxin B excreted in urine is minimal, which is 1 to 4%. That is why in patients with nephrotoxicity, we favor polymyxin B use. However, Evans et al. reported that up to 60% of polymyxin B is excreted in urine on continuous use. So patients who are on uh, uh, polymyxin B for some time will have progressively increasing renal excretion of polymyxin B and that can sometimes cause nephrotoxicity. So uh, we concluded that probably nebulization cholestine, which uh, usually does not attain a significant systemic levels was not responsible for butter-like phenotype in our patient and it was due to polymyxin B. So we had made a diagnosis of polymyxin B associated butter-like phenotype, the treatment of which is uh, discontinuation of the offending drug. So whenever we have a patient with acquired butter syndrome due to drug, the cornerstone of therapy is discontinuation of the offending drug and diligent correction of fluids and electrolyte disturbances. However, in our patient, we did not have a better option to discontinue polymyxin. So uh, our patient was having uh, MDR clepsiella, uh, which we had required both from ET aspects as well as blood, strongly uh, supporting the fact that a patient was having a sepsis due to MDR clepsiella. The multidrug resistant clepsiella can be because of uh, various uh, mechanisms. The common mechanisms of uh, multidrug resistance in clepsiella is OXA48 and NDM in India. KPC is more common in Western countries, however, it is very rare in India. Our patient was probably having OXA48, uh, which is supported by the fact that uh, the culture sensitivity showed resistance to astrionam. Generally, OXA48 and KPCs are resistant to all the antibiotics on the antibiogram except for uh, polymyxin. However, NDM is uh, so, uh, sensitive to astronam. Our patient had uh, resistance to astronam, indicating that our patient was either having OXA48, which is very common in India, sorry. otherwise... Sorry? Now carry on. Yeah. So, uh, probably our patient was OXA48 uh, because this is more common in India. So, in a patient with OXA48 associated uh, severe Klebsiella infections, novel beta lactam, beta lactam is inhibitors are preferred. Ceftazidim avibactam is commonly used, usually along with astrionam to cover the uh, cover NDM if it is uh, uh, which usually coexists. Miropenem weborbactam, imipenem silastatin rilabactam, and cefedericol are the other preferred alternatives. However, in resource limited settings where these are not available, polymyxin B can be used, but not as a first line option, rather as a less preferred option. As ceftazidim avibactam is costly and not readily available, we had to continue with IV polymyxin B in our patient, despite our patient developing acquired barter syndrome. So, so how long how long did you use polymyxin B? I mean, so we for patient had associated pneumonia. So how long did you use it, and how what is the minimum duration or the ideal duration? For antibiotic in VAP. So, Dr. Uh, your views on use of uh, antibiotics and your use of polymyxin B in the setting of VAP. Yeah, so, uh, so usually, I mean, previously the notion was there that this has to be used for a prolonged duration, 14 days or more, but nowadays it, uh, studies have shown that even shorter duration, seven, even 10 days of polymyxin B, they suffice in treating ventilator assisted pneumonia, especially when we have got the regimen uh, correct. So polymyxin B is given together with another active drug. So even seven to 10 days of treatment is sufficient. So I think this patient ended up getting 10 days of treatment, Bhavesh, or 14 days? Yes. Yes. 14 days. But when we are discontinuing polymyxin B, we have to keep it. When we are discontinuing treatment for ventilator associated pneumonia, we have to also see the patient's clinical picture in mind that the patient has responded, there is no fever, and you know, secretions have come down, and there is no new onset, um, uh, you know, infiltrates, which uh, can be a harbinger of, uh, you know, progressing or uh, new onset. Back. So, taking the patient's clinical picture also is important uh, as far as discontinuing the treatment of VAP is concerned. Absolutely. So uh, the minimum duration is around seven days. You don't necessarily have to continue it. And that is true for anti 
message in general. You know, longer duration does not actually lead to better outcomes. It may actually bring about more resistance in your patient as far as secondary infections are concerned. And the point that Dr. Bhavesh was trying to make here about you know the use of uh, ceftazidim, avibactam, and actinam is that you see this uh, avibactam has been uh, developed in the West, and the main carbonyl uh, is that they have there is uh, KPCs. KPCs are common in India. The kind of carbonyl that we have here is NDN, and to some degree oxa 48. So when you give uh, ceftazidim, avibactam, it takes care of any. Oxa 48 or KPC, which may be being produced by the bacteria. But if NDM is being produced, your septicidine, avibacterium is not going to work because you get lined by the NDM. So here you have to combine with astronam because astronam is resistant to NDM. So the most potent combination as of now is septicidine, avibacterium plus astronam which will take care of uh, KPCs, OXA48, NDM, and certain other minor uh, beta lactamases and carboponemases. But at the same time, if the bug is also producing uh, your uh, other ECSBL or other kind of lactamases with astronam and is producing NDM, then your combination of septicidine, avibactam, and will also fail. But it is my uh, request to everybody, please use septazidine, avibactam sparingly because it is the last uh, and it should not be used as a drop of a hat. So uh, with that, uh, I think continue Dr. Uh, uh, Avesh. Yes. Uh, so our patient was probably having polymix in the associated bartle like syndrome and in view of non-availability of a better alternative in our uh, setting, we had to continue IV polymyxin B while supplementing the electrolytes that were uh, low and uh, also managing the volume status. The patient was ultimately, uh, uh, patient ultimately received of IV polymyxin and had uh, the polymyxin stopped. And uh, after discontinuation of polymyxin B, we noted that uh, within six days of uh, discontinuation of polymyxin, the urine output normalized the, uh, the metabolic alkalosis improved, the patient's potassium and magnesium started to rise, strongly supporting that probably poly uh, polymixin was responsible for bartle like phenotype in our patient. Can be seen, here, seen here in the table, metabolic alkalosis had resolved, the urine output had normalized, and the magnesium also was improving and potassium was also improving. So we made a final diagnosis of post-COVID fibrosis with ventilator-associated pneumonia, which was resolved and a polymyxin uh, induced barter like syndrome, which also resolved. The patient was uh, eventually weaned off ventilatory support and was later decanulated and discharged. Okay. So, uh, some, summarize, please. Uh, yes. Uh, so, uh, we would like to bring these uh, important take home points. Hypokalemia and metabolic alkalosis are a common problem in ICU patients with multiple causes. Polyuria with characteristic of electrolyte abnormalities, chloride unresponsive metabolic alkalosis, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and hypercalciuria in C is seen in patients who are on blue diuretics. However, in patients who are not on blue diuretics, we consider the possibility of Barter syndrome, specifically acquired Barter syndrome. Drugs are the most common cause of acquired Barter syndrome. Among which, polymyxin and aminoglycosides are implicated. Discontinuation of the offending drug and correction of fluid and electrolyte disturbances are the cornerstone of treatment of acquired barter syndrome. I would like to thank uh, our moderator, Professor Naval sir, and panelist Animes sir and uh, Tapesh sir for giving me this opportunity. Dr. Bhavesh, wonderful presentation. Uh, any questions? We are happy to take them. Please uh, stop share screen. So, I would just like to you know, talk about one drug or one case we had of uh, polyuria. So the patient was actually post-operative. Polyuria comes in all shapes and sizes. Uh, the OT and after 12 hours, uh, uh, he, she he started having a lot of uh, polyuria. And there was no obvious reason. So what he actually found was then after you know analyzing everything was that halothane induced. So halothanes, uh, if you look up the textbook, also cause fluorines, are also known to cause polyuria. So it was very 
get a lot of post surgical patients in the icu and uh, this was uh, the only occasion in which there was uh, anesthesia induced uh, health induced uh, polyuria chlorine the to cause uh, polyuria so it was quite interesting and the other thing is it is not uncommon at all in the icu to see the patient renal output going up suddenly and you know uh, 200 ml per hour for uh, next 10 to 12 hours 24 hours and you wonder what is happening so to all the residents what happens is these this is normally in the setting of uh, uh, resolving sepsis you give a lot of fluids to sepsis patients and once the sepsis starts uh, resolving this extravascular fluid gets mobilized to the intravascular compartment and you start uh, removing this fluid spontaneously that is the patient starts removing the fluid spontaneously and there is a spontaneous diuresis the second situation in which this occurs is when you liberate the patient from the positive pressure ventilation because positive pressure ventilation has a tendency to retain water because if you give a positive pressure ventilation there is decreased perfusion and there is decreased retention of water by mechanism of aldosterone at the same time the blood pressure is somewhat lowered on positive pressure ventilation there is increased adh secretion which tends to retain water so the moment you remove the patient off the ventilator they can be or you switch the patient from higher pressures that is controlled uh, ventilation to uh, psp or something with lower pressures then of course again you get uh, increased diuresis so this is uh, how you actually get spontaneous polyuria sometimes in the icu which uh, should be uh, looked into in these particular ways apart from the drugs and other causes which you mentioned hyperglycemia and mannitol and diuretics and uh, so on So wonderful uh, presentation, a rare presentation, and does occur. Any comments, uh, Doctor Animesh? Uh, no, I mean, first, Bhavish, it was very nicely presented, and uh, you know the slides were really informative, and you kept it simple. So you know, uh, so uh, you deserve all the laurels for that, as Doctor Bansal has said. Regarding the case proper, I uh, I agree with Doctor uh, Bansal that. Uh, you know polyuria as such is not probably so uncommon in the icu but sometimes it so happens that whenever we talk about kidney function we are more interested in whether the patient has oliguria and anuria and uh, when the patient has polyuria sometimes it so happens that when the urine output is adequate we just say it's adequate we don't mention that uh, the patient is having more than say 60 ml per kg in 24 hours or having more than 3 liters So in this particular case, also if you would see that this is this is exactly what happened. Um, the our attention to polyuria, it was uh, it came on later after we tried to fit in the puzzle and we tried to see how the electrolyte disturbances they were related to the kidney function. So I think that's important. Uh, whenever we uh, whenever we face polyuria in the ICU, again we should take it in a proper algorithmic. approach and um, uh, you know many, many a times uh, many or many many a times uh, we would be able to get one of the reasons as dr bansal was uh, was saying that in this patient it was an anesthesia for our case it was bottle like syndrome due to polymixin so in fact uh, in the last six months i think i can i can off the top of my head remember four or five cases so since colistin and you know other agents like uh, amino glycosides and polymixin b they are being used Uh, in 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 uh, uh, use uh, you know right left and center so i suspect that there would be more and more cases uh, like this so uh, i think it would be important that uh, whenever such manifestations develop that we keep the consideration of acquired uh, bls in uh, in the patient and we take um, uh, we take appropriate measures to you know keep the patient and manage the patient uh, so that's 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 all from my side thank you Thank you, Doctor Reza. Doctor Naval sir, and all Professor Vikram sir, any, any comments from your side, sir? Yeah, I think the, as Anish mentioned, this was a this was actually a challenging case who which was uh, transferred to us from another hospital, and uh, we had uh, quite a difficult time with him initially, including uh, this problem that he had the polyuria, and uh, uh, subsequently we did. But our limitation was that we had to continue the ending drug for uh, some time due to lack of uh, other alternatives as they were uh, not available actually in the hospital formulary and uh, due to expenses for the patients to be bought from outside. So yes, but still after that, uh, patients improved and uh, in fact at one point of time, 
um, we had really uh, the the hope for the patient getting out of the hospital was very less and finally he walked out of the hospital and is doing well today so these are the common problems uh, which we'll definitely face more and more because of the increased use of uh, polymixin and cholesterol so as anyway said left right and center is the right uh, expression for that they are being used and uh, we will come across and we should be aware about it and rather than chasing the man uh, chasing the urine output and managing the other uh, electrolyte abnormalities along with that i think it's very important to look at the possible causes which uh, can be taken care of and uh, Offending drugs can be managed. I think Mahesh has very well and uh, summarized the whole thing in a very simplified manner in uh, these slides. Congratulations to that, and that will be all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nawal sir. So I must congratulate all of you, the and the Department of Medicine, uh, Dr. Nawal Kishore sir, and Dr. Animesh sir, and Bhavesh sir, for uh, making this presentation. And Bhavesh has really done a wonderful work. Very nice slides, review of literature, excellent. And congratulations to the department also for taking this case out and sending him home. Difficult case, severe COVID, ARDS, fibrosis, and then such severe electrolyte disturbance. So congratulations to all of you and Wendell Bhavesh. And thanks to you, Professor Naval sir and Anamesh sir for making this possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhavesh. Thank you.